caught up in the song. I forgot to turn the recorder off. Okay. You take your Bibles and be turning with me to Mark chapter 1. Yes, we're still in Mark chapter 1. Uh, and we're going to look today, starting with verse 21, as, as we continue to look at as Jesus begins his ministry. <laughs> We find beginning Mark chapter 1, beginning with verse 21, it says, They went to Capernaum. The they is Jesus and his disciples. Okay. They went to Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and began to teach. They were amazed at his teaching. There the they is the crowd and the disciples especially. For he was teaching as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, saying, What business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? You come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. <laughs> Drawing him into convulsions, the unclean spirit cried out with a loud voice and came out of him. They were all amazed, so that they debated among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. Immediately the news about him spread everywhere into all the surrounding district of Galilee. And so we come to this, and, and we need to see a couple of things. First of all, we need to see that I had a two-page outline to preach from, and when I printed it out, I apparently only printed page two. <laughs> so for those of you that think that pastors never make mistakes, guess what? <laughs> but here's, here, here's what we need to do. We need to take apart this passage and see what happens. Jesus goes into the synagogue and he begins to teach. Now it was common for people, traveling rabbis, to go about and teach in the synagogues. I tried to go low tech, not bring the computer in here and then I lost it. Uh, but they would go about and they would teach and it was typical that what you had is you had the, a prescribed passage to read that day and then you would offer an opinion on it. And the way that the scribes would teach is that they would come in and they would read and then they had a seat, they would stand up to read and then they would sit down and teach. And as they sat there to teach, they would say as rabbi, and they would name a rabbi before them, taught that this rabbi taught, that this rabbi wrote. And it would be kind of like if I were to sit here and say, well, that this morning's sermon, when we look at this, as Adrian Rogers preached about what Charles Spurgeon preached, when Charles Spurgeon quoted Thomas Helways about what John Chrysostom said. God said, do this. Now, all of those people that I just named are good preachers. And in fact, you can't go wrong if you want to uh, have your spiritual life guided by uh, Spurgeon and Rogers and, you know, Hellways is all right. He speaks Middle English and he's hard to understand. Uh, John Chrysostom is typically translated from Latin into Latin Greek into English. So, you know, he's, he's good. I like all those guys. But that's the way they taught. And it doesn't sound like it has a whole lot of of force because you spend all this time making sure that you tell people that, well, it's not my idea. And in fact, the authority is based on this person and this person and this person and this person. But one of the differences we see in Jesus is that when he sits down to teach, and that was the standard post posture of a teacher, was to sit and teach. So everybody had to kind of gather in and listen. You stood to present, to read the word. You stood, everybody stood. We used to do that. I stopped doing it because, uh, I, don't, I don't really know why I stopped doing it. Just, I, I stopped, I, we, we didn't do it, and then we did it for a while, and then we stopped doing it. Maybe we should go back to it. Uh, but you stood, and you read the word, and then you sat down to teach as if to point out, you know, the word is what's most important. When Jesus taught... He didn't sit there and say, well, as this rabbi said and this rabbi said. He would simply teach directly and say, this is what I say. This is why things like the Sermon on the Mount and some of the other places where he says, you've heard it said this, but I say to you this. You have heard it said, do not commit adultery. But I say to you, anyone who has looked upon a woman with lust in his heart has already committed adultery with her. Now, there's a couple of errors we make on that. We'll take this little side train because I don't have my outline, so I'm going to chase rabbits. Sometimes we make the area that says, well, Jesus says it's just as bad if you think 
about it as if you do it. So if you think about it, go ahead and do it. Wrong. Which is worse, for you to think about robbing a bank or actually robbing a bank? To go ahead and do it is wrong. It's another sin. He's not saying, well, if you've thought about it, you might as well go ahead. He's saying the sin, your actions, take root in your thoughts. And so if your thoughts are geared sinfully, eventually it's going to come out in sinful actions. And so what you have to change is not your behavior. Let me give you all something. We're 31 days into your New Year's resolutions. Stop trying to change your behavior. Change your thoughts. Change your attitudes. Let God transform you by the renewing of your mind, which I think he told us in Romans. Don't be conformed to this world any longer, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Yeah, that's Romans. Well, 1 and 2. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. And then you'll be able to know what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Let God change the way you think about things, and then that comes out through your actions. You want to be a less hateful person in your speech to other people around you? Let God give you peace in your heart and manifest the fruit of the Spirit through you. Let your attitudes change, and then your actions will follow. What you do is a product of your attitude. What you do is a product of your thoughts. That's what Jesus is talking about. Adultery comes from lust. And you can hold the action back all you want to, but if the sin is in your heart, it's going to find its way out in other ways. The same thing with murder. Murder comes from envy, hate, strife, anger, whatever it may be. And so if you don't res restrain the attitude, eventually the actions will come out. You say, I've never killed anybody. Yeah, have you ever gotten mad at somebody and speak to them for a year? You treated them like they were dead. What's the difference? He's not saying that you're active. If you thought about it, go ahead and do it. He's saying, don't do it. And on top of that, let your thoughts change. But he taught that with authority. He didn't come up with that and say, now, you know, and if you don't, if you're not sure if I'm right, here's places you can go look it up. In fact, his authority is to the point of this. There's a man present in the, in the synagogue who has an unclean spirit. Now, some of the time in Scripture, in, in, in the New Testament world, Scripture uses the, the term unclean spirit to refer to two different sets of problems. One problem is being possessed or afflicted by a demonic spirit. The other problem is having a mental or physical problem that doesn't manifest itself with a visible symptom, but would be something on the order of epilepsy, that you can't explain what happens, and all of a sudden somebody starts acting really odd, or any other physical or mental ailment that is demonstrated through physical manifestations. Okay, so sometimes it's a mental health problem, and sometimes it's a demon. Usually, if they talk, they're demons. Okay, in this case, it's a demon, because the demon could argue with Jesus. What business do we have with you? What business do you have with us? We know who you are. It's important to realize this. The fact that somebody knows the name of Jesus does not make them a believer who walks in faith and in obedience to God. The demon knew that Jesus of Nazareth is the Holy One of Israel. They knew he was the Messiah. And they were a demon from the pits of hell. Folks, just because somebody uses the name Jesus doesn't mean they have a clue what they're talking about. And I'll uh, add on to that this. Just because you can answer a question, who's Jesus, and pass a New Testament studies test, which hopefully most of you could, and if you can't, we're working on it. Just because you can answer those questions does not mean that you have let your heart be transformed by the power of God. 
There comes a moment where a person surrenders their will to Christ and says, you know, I don't have all the answers yet, but I know this. As John Newton said, we'll go back to his authority. He's the guy who wrote the song Amazing Grace. I know this. I'm a great sinner and he is a great savior. I'm a person in need of salvation. And I may not be able to answer all the questions in the world about the Bible, but I can tell you this. I need Christ. The demons knew this. They wanted to avoid it. Jesus cast the demon out. He goes back on as far as you can tell. He goes back on with the sermon. Oh, I love this. Jesus does things like that. Goes back on with the sermon. Paul raises a guy from the dead later on in the book of Acts. Goes on with the sermon and preaches all night. Y'all think a baby crying is going to throw me off? Not a chance. <laughs> These guys do all sorts of amazing things and keep on preaching. Jesus is the Son of God. He doesn't let his sermon get interrupted. He just heals the guy and goes on. So I try to go. I try to go on. You know, leave, let, leave my the uh, first page of the outline alone. You know, somewhere throw me off. No, he doesn't even have an outline. Of course, he wrote the book. And the people still marvel. They said it's a teaching with authority. Jesus' authority to teach is verified, is demonstrated, is, a, is pictured to the people because he's able to cast out a demon and say, get out of him and leave him alone. The man was a disrupt, disruption and a distraction amidst the things the synagogue was trying to do. But Jesus saw through the problem. He didn't say, hey, can somebody get that guy to sit down and shut up? Jesus didn't say, hey, you know what, uh, maybe the better place for him is, is in our extended session, or maybe we need to get him some counseling elsewhere. Jesus re recognized what the problem was, dealt with the problem. He didn't fault the man for being demon possessed. He knew the man needed him. Sometimes those of us who are churchy people get worked up because people come into our church services and they don't know how to be churchy people with us. They don't realize that you're supposed to dress nice. They don't realize that you're not supposed to talk and ask questions in the middle of things. They don't realize that you're supposed to sit still. And we want to make sure that we put some things out there and control their behavior. I remember a church fight not here, elsewhere. I've been in enough different, that's why, that's why preachers kind of go to different churches across their growing up years, is so that they can tell church stories and be able to mask it. It's like, it wasn't here and it wasn't the last place I was. Beyond that, you don't get to know, but it's not y'all. But I remember an extended church fight over the fact that some people were wearing sweatpants to church. And they wanted to make sure, they wanted to put deacons at the door to turn away people that would come to church in sweatpants. Now, y'all, I'd like for you to come to church dressed decently, not in some kind of way that's a massive distraction to the world around you. But beyond that, I just don't care. You want to wear yoga pants? Go ahead. Be here. You want to wear your finest and the finest of your finery? Go ahead. Be here. Let your heart be present. I have my reasons why I wear a coat and tie in church on Sunday. One of them's name is Larry. <laughs> you don't know me. That's my father. I at one time made the mistake of going home on vacation over a Sunday, and I did not pack a tie because the church that we were going to was not a tie-wearing church, and I was not the preacher. We got ready to go to church. Dad said, come here. Opened the closet door and said, which one do you want? Out of respect for my father, I picked a necktie. Out of respect for my father, I still wear a necktie when I preach on Sunday mornings. Many of you have told me not to worry about it. That's fine. I don't worry about him. I worry about him. <laughs> <laughs> Scripture tells me to honor my father and my mother. So I don't tell bad jokes about my mother, and I would put on a necktie to honor my father. <laughs> the result of which is I'll tell, I'll tell funny stories about him. <laughs> you can either have a tie, or you can have to stay quiet. Those are your choices. I don't care if you wear a tie or not. If your heart's here, that's the concern. I don't care if you have to lean over and ask the person beside you, wait a minute, what was he talking about? That's fine. Why don't 
it doesn't bother me if you've got a baby that's restless with you. I maybe bo I bother them more than they bother me. <laughs> they get to crying too much, take them out. It's probably because they're listening to me. It's okay. Jesus is not disturbed by this man other than by seeing his need and meeting it. And his need is for the gospel. Most people that come among us, somebody wanders in off the street and they haven't eaten and they haven't bathed in a couple days. Y'all, they don't need a lecture. They need the gospel. And all y'all are here, and so I, I know it's not, it's, it's not your issue, but something that needs to be very, very clear, especially in this neck of the woods. I don't care if you come in here on Sunday morning and waiters and you've still got duck camel on your face. If you can be here, that's fine. And y'all, if you have a problem with somebody coming in with ducks still in the back of the truck, but that's how they could be here, then it's your problem, not theirs. You have a problem with people that Jesus didn't have. And that is you have a problem with their appearance. You're not concerned with their heart. Jesus teaches, though, and he, he rebukes the demon, sends it out of the man, and people say, I don't get this. The new teaching with authority. The teaching that can tell people what to do. So what is authority? When they're marveled at this, authority is the right to instruct others about the truth and demand that they comply with it. It's something that Jesus has. He teaches with authority. And he can tell people this is the truth and you have to do it. He can tell the demons what to do. Jesus has authority. The right to instruct others in truth and demand that they follow it. So who has authority? The Word of God. Jesus is the Word of God. That's what we have in John chapter 1. Remember what that says. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is the Word of God in flesh, walking the earth. He has authority. When God says something, it happens. From Genesis 1... Through Revelation 22, there is nothing that God says that does not happen. God says, let there be light. And there's not a committee meeting, there's not a vote, there's not, a, there's not a, a, an environmental impact study as to whether or not it's a good idea or a bad idea for there to be light. There simply is light. Scripture doesn't give us the process by which there became light. Scripture doesn't tell us where light came from. It just says, God said, let there be light, and there was light. Why? Because the Word of God has authority. Jesus tells the demon, get out. And it does, because the Word has authority. At other times, Jesus looks at the dead and says, get up. And they do, because the Word has authority. <laughs> Authority is found in the Word of God and in the Word of God alone. You say, wait a minute. Don't I get to tell people what to do? Not if what you tell them to do contradicts the Word of God. Now, you say, wait a minute. Now the Word of God doesn't tell us anything about duck hunting regulations or farming, farming instructions. No, but it does give us some guidelines about obeying the law of the land if it doesn't contradict God's law. It gives guidelines about what good stewardship and right use of our time is. It gives us guidelines about being careful about the lives of people around us. <laughs> Guess where most of those laws fit? Inside those boxes. You don't know why you should wear orange if you go out hunting deer in the modern gun season? Because God says every human life is precious. Every life matters to him. The fact that the state of Arkansas says it's a law, eh. their law has value because it is backed with God's authority about valuing human life. Why should you be careful what's downrange when you pull the trigger on a deer? Because human life is valuable. Even if somebody was foolish enough to go out in the woods without an orange vest on. God's word has authority, and it is the sole authority in the life of a believer. So, if the word of God has authority, who doesn't have authority? Anything and anyone not the word of God. That doesn't mean that they're automatically wrong. If you have a math book, it can be right. It's useful, it's valuable. But it does not demand your obedience. Equals four is a fact. 
It's not something that demands your obedience. It's just reality. Gravity, what goes up must come down, is a reality. Based in the created order and the way God made the universe. And it's inescapable. But nothing else has authority that the Word of God has. That includes preachers. Including this one. Any authority that I have is based in, this is what the Word of God says. I can tell you that the Word says that we shouldn't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. You ought to be here with God's people. I can't tell you what you have to wear or anything else. I can tell you that together we have decided as a church family what times and what days we'd like to gather. That all of us have made that decision. But our authority comes from the Word of God and not from anything else. There are some things that the Word of God has been silent about. There are some things that the Word of God has been clear enough about. People like to go around and write extra books and say, well, I think God also said this. Folks, when somebody starts in with God said and it's not followed by a direct quote from the Bible, they've gone off the edge of the map. The things I can assure you God said are the things that are found here. And not the part in the center column. <laughs> That's a cross-reference section. Not the table of contents. Not the index and not the book of maps. This is what God has said. Nothing else has the authority that this does. Where does the authority sit in the church? Does it sit in the pastor? Does it sit in the deacons? Does it sit in business meeting? Well, now business meeting is how we decide what we believe the word of God. What God has told us to do as a church It's how we sit together and say, how do we do what God has told us to do? Nothing happens in a Baptist church unless a business meeting, unless we vote on it and do it. Some of you may wonder why we've never done this, that, or the other. Well, you know, we can talk about it all day, and, but if somebody will show up Wednesday night and move that we do it, we might actually get it done. Because that's how we get things done. But the authority for the church still sits in the Word of God. Your Sunday school material, great, helpful, useful. Arkansas Christian Parent Magazine, great, helpful, useful. The authority comes from the Word. Not my ideas, not your ideas. But what does the Word say that we ought to do? Live humbly, do justice, walk humbly before our God, care for widows and orphans in their distress. Go, therefore, and teach all nations to observe what God has commanded, to make disciples. The rest of it, we sort out how we're going to do it best, using the wisdom God's given us. But the authority comes from the Word of God. Where's the authority in your life as a believer in Jesus? In the Word of God. Parents, as your authority, you are an authority figure over your children because Scripture says so. But your goal as a parent is to teach them to come to the Word of God and build their life around that. Not to build their life around what Mom said, what Daddy said, what Grandma said, what Grandpa said. Nanny, Papa, Granny, Grampy, whatever term you use for yourself, for yourselves, aunts, uncles, cousins, our driving force is to get our children, to get the people we have influence over, to hold on to the Word of God as their authority. Because there is coming a day that they won't be able to call you and ask you what they ought to do. It may be because you're busy. It may be because they have no cell service. And it may be because you've gone on to be with Jesus. It may be because they have to make a decision in an instant. And they need to answer for themselves, what does the Word of God say that I should do? The authority in all of our lives individually is in the Word of God. Where does the authority sit for the world? You ready? Anybody know where this is going? The authority for the world sits in the Word of God. It doesn't sit in a newly sworn in Congress and in a, in a angels and ministers of grace to finish. We're already running for president in 2016. We'll be so sick of that by the time it's over. It doesn't sit in the current president, the next president, the new governor. I got a phone call this past week asking a survey question. How do I feel about 
the, the performance of the governor of the state of Arkansas in his office. It's like, he's been at it two weeks. Folks, it's never fair to judge somebody as whether they're doing well or doing poorly at their job after two weeks. Okay? Give them a little bit more time. Don't judge your kids on whether or not they picked up a new skill inside of two weeks, parents. Give them at least three. Okay? <laughs> Depending on the skill, some skills, yeah, they actually should be able to pick up. But governing is a little bit tougher. The authority for the state of Arkansas doesn't sit in the governor's office or in the legislature. It doesn't sit in the Constitution. It sits in the Word of God. Now, does God allow other governing authorities to exist? He does. Do sometimes those authorities drive us to have to make choices whether we're going to obey them or obey what the Word of God says? Yes, sometimes they do. Those times are inescapable. Those times are coming. Those times are real for very many people in the world today. She's got a copy of a book that I'll be reading across the next month. It's entitled Too Many to Jail, and it's about the growth of the church in the nation of Iran. God has allowed a government there that's very hostile to Christianity. Guess what? The churches in Iran are having trouble finding places to meet, not because the government won't let them meet, the government won't, they know that, but because they can't find places big enough. I am astounded and I am blessed for the fact that we have to keep, you know, we've had to add some Sunday school literature, we've had to pick, pick up more bulletins. We're seeing more people come to church than we've seen in several years. But it's easy to come here. There it involves avoiding the police and avoiding the, the unofficial religious police who roam the streets looking for people who don't comply. And if they had a building this size that they could meet safely in, they'd pack it with three to 400 people. You say, you can't fit 400 people in here. I guarantee you, you can if you try hard enough. Folks, the authority in this world sits in the Word of God. It doesn't sit in presidents and mullahs and ayatollahs and popes and pastors, UN Security Council members. It sits in the Word of God. So what are we going to do about it? We teach people the Word. We teach people the Word by showing in our lives that God's Word has authority over us. By letting the fruit of the Spirit show, by letting God's commands show in how we act, how we behave towards people. We let the Word of God direct how our attention is spent, how our efforts are given forth. We teach people the Word by our words. We actually open our mouths and share with them this is what God has said. Not our opinion, but what's plainly there. For this reason shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, and so God established marriage. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Look after the widows and orphans in their distress. These are things that we ought to be doing, and we ought to open our mouths when people say, why do we do this? We do it because God sent to. Why do we need to stop the food pantry and staff it and help out? Because God said to. Not because, because there are hungry people, but because God said we ought to feed them. And so when somebody asks, we ought to express it. Why do we look out for these things? We teach by word. We teach by deed. We teach by word. We teach by life. We teach by building relationships with people that need to see Jesus. These are things that we ought to do. <clears throat> Not to teach people to come follow our instructions, not to teach people and try to put people under our thumb so that they have to do what we say. But to teach people to have that direct one-on-one -on -one relationship with Christ, that direct relationship with God where they're able to take His Word and say, okay, Lord, what do I do today? So what about that for you? You ever come under the authority of the Word in the first place and said, Lord, all I am is a sinner and I need to save you? Have you 
publicly committed your life to that, that you publicly committed yourself to be a part of a fellowship of believers that's willing to walk with Jesus. Well, thank you for your holding back. Thank you, Father. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to be here. And we pray, Lord God, that you will help us to serve you with our lives and walk in your